fun spoken issues. It's Friday night fun. Here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the unspoken issues podcast. I am your host, Jesse Starcher, and we are taking a look tonight at the rematch of the century. That is correct. Superman versus Doomsday part two. This is a book that dropped in 1994. It's called Superman Doomsday Hunter Prey. To talk about this book tonight, it is Chris Armstrong. Whose idea was this anyway? This was yours, wasn't it? Yeah, I had read this one several times and I saw it pop up a month or two ago on maybe in a Facebook group or something, some discussion about it. I think when I, when we started doing these like uh, extended episodes of Unspoken Issues, I had already had the idea of maybe doing this eventually. But yeah, it's one, it's a uh, three issue miniseries and it came out at a time. I think it came out during that gap when I was kind of out of comics for about a year and a half mm-hmm. and I caught up to it later. So there was even more build up for me than even when it came out, because by the time I read it, it had been like probably five or six years since the Death of Superman story had been right. released. And I really liked it. I've read it probably seven or eight times, uh, you know, over the years. There is a lot that happens in this book. At least it paints a picture of this mysterious, like, out-of-nowhere villain that showed up and killed the Man of Steel. Mm. So we get a little bit more of a a look into the history of Doomsday, and, of course, we get our rematch. Um, You know, hey, we're not alone here, though. Evan Bevins is joining us tonight to talk some Superman Doomsday. Evan, do you have the issues for this, or did you? is this a hoopla special? I've got one or two of the issues. I read it off of Hoopla this time around, but I know I have one or two of the issues that I I think I got in a batch of comics I bought somewhere that somebody gave to me. Busy time of year. You said it was on Hoopla, so I went digital this time all around. Right, that's all right. That's all right. Was there more to this collection, too, in that, that was on Hoopla, or is it just this? Yeah, there's like a Doomsday Annual number one that's, that's labeled with a year one on it. Uh-huh. So some old uh, old doomsday stories. I didn't get to read through those yet, but I mean, you got Jerry Ordway, Dan Jurgens, Lee Simonson, and Roger Stern writing them. So mm. not a bad lineup there. And then there was Superman: The Doomsday Wars. It's like the third part of like the Doomsday trilogy, sort of. <laughs> After gotcha. The other Superman in this, he comes back in Doomsday Wars that Dan Jurgens also, uh, I think, wrote and did the art on. And it's not any good. I, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't like it when it came out and I reread it uh, during the pandemic. I got all these the, all the trades of like Death of Superman, Funeral for a Friend, uh, Reign of Superman, Return of Superman. And then had uh, the last one was a Superman Doomsday trade. And so I read all through those like as soon as the pandemic started when I was actually off work. I think I was off for like two weeks and then I was right back <laughs> to work. Yeah, I reread it then and I was like, it's not any better than I remember. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is the first time I've read this. I mean, w- when we reached the end of the story, you, you, there's no doubt in my mind that should have been it for Doomsday. Mm. I mean, my gosh, yep. this is... Uh, <laughs> there's, Jesse, I don't know have how you read a back. comic before? <laughs> <laughs> right. We'll circle. I want to circle back to Doomsday Wars after we're done talking about this one. And I'll kind of air some of my grievances, I guess. <laughs> it is Festivus. Yep. It is. It is. Let me talk about the creative team here. So Dan Jurgens on the story and the layouts. Brett Breeding with the art, uh, finished art. Bill Oakley on lettering. And Greg Gregory Wright, friend of the show. Gregory Wright on colors, yep. uh, color guides. And then color separations by Android Images. So... This dropped April 12th, 1994, this first issue did. And I don't, Superman dies in 92? It ain't 92, is it? Or is it 93? I believe it's 92. You're right, Chris. It was 92 because uh, I came this close to re-airing my death of Superman in celebration of the 30th anniversary. That just happened. So, yeah. So, yeah, 1994, this is hitting the shelves. It's about a year and a half after the death of Superman. Superman's come back. He's trying to get used to being alive again. What was this thing that killed him? Uh, So that's kind of where we start here. He's also got a mullet at this point. You need to make sure. Oh, yes. Don't skip that. All right, here we go. Issue one of Superman Doomsday Hunter Prey. It has been mere weeks according to DC timeline, since Superman returned from the dead after meeting his end in a climactic battle against Doomsday, a fight that apparently killed both combatants. 
Now, Superman wants to find the body of Doomsday to try to understand his origins. There's only one problem. The evil cyborg Superman tied him to a large rock and launched him into the atmosphere. In deep space, a cargo ship on its way to Darkseid's homeworld, Apocalypse, discovers the asteroid carrying Doomsday. Bringing it on the ship, they soon find that Doomsday is still alive and he escapes, killing the crew. The spaceship soon lands on Apocalypse and Doomsday begins brutally killing its inhabitants. We also learn that Cyborg Superman transported his consciousness and body into a compact form and hitched a ride on Doomsday's back. Now, Cyborg Superman aims to become ruler of Apocalypse after Doomsday levels it. However, Darkseid has had enough and squares off with Doomsday pummeling him with his Omega Beams. Inexplicably, climbing from the impact crater, Doomsday attacks Darkseid, knocking him unconscious. Meanwhile, Darkseid's faithful servant, Desaad, posts a call for help to anyone that can hear. Superman ends up answering that call and arrives on Apocalypse to find Doomsday and Cyborg Superman, two enemies he thought were dead, very much alive. Realizing things are growing direr by the minute, Desaad opens a boom tube just behind Doomsday and before Superman can make it there, it sucks Doomsday in and closes up. Now Superman is afraid that he has lost Doomsday forever and worse yet, Doomsday could be on Earth continuing his destruction. I, I mean, I got some talking points here. I mean, what do you guys think Lois and Clark's cat's name is? <laughs> I assume it's Streaky. Okay, help me out here, because has Superman's cat ever showed up before? I mean, there there are super pets, not necessarily the lineup that was shown in the movie this summer, but there's a, mm-hmm. what, Streaky the super cat, Crypto the super dog, Tom the super horse. No, Beppo. That's Beppo the super cat. <laughs> Small of stature, but prehensile of tail and large of heart. <laughs> I, I stole that from Wizard. Uh, sorry. No one would have known, Evan. You could have <laughs> taken credit for it. This is the internet. Somebody would have been like, that guy. <laughs> so I, don't know if, I don't know if that's streaky in that case or not. I mean, you know, if it's Lois's cat, it might be, you know, Woodward or Bernstein or something like that. But, uh, <laughs> All right. All right. So let's let's talk. Throw All up right. a Twitter poll on this. I, uh, I will do that. Are, are we uh, done with issue one now? You want to go ahead straight to issue two? <laughs> Yeah, that's all my notes. <laughs> that's all the relevant information from the first issue. <laughs> right. So anybody want to take a stab at explaining to me again what Cyborg Superman did here? In the Reign of Superman story, Cyborg Superman is the one who strapped Doomsday to the asteroid and left him to float in space. You know which it was supposed to be his dead body. He People thought he was dead. I don't know if, if Cyborg thought he was dead or not. Yeah, he, he's the one that left him to, to uh, float. So I guess he put a piece of himself on Doomsday's body. So if he was defeated elsewhere, he would have a backup. So he could just like reconstitute himself out of this thing. And I mean, he's he kind is... of like Tron. If, one, if a piece of him okay. survives, all right, he can he can come back. I guess that seems to be how it works. He was mostly Data and he... He took over the armor that that dude was in that uh, Doomsday killed. Oh, okay. All right, that makes more yeah. sense. I think it was mostly like data or energy, and then he, because apparently that's a pretty fancy suit of armor if you're not fighting Doomsday. Uh, <laughs> yeah, he, he, he took that over and ma- remade it in his image, so to speak. This issue also with Cyborg Superman, he's trying to call himself Cyborg now. Yeah, I think Victor Stone was uh, not really doing much. And, uh, you know, DC <laughs> and Marvel never met a name they didn't want to recycle. That's true. That's what I was thinking. I was like, how, why? You, you can't. Cyborg, I would think, is synonymous with a hero. And now all of a sudden we're just going to be like, oh, yeah, OK, we're just going to start calling this villain Cyborg. I mean, well, it's I not the like. the difference is Hank Henshaw is the Cyborg. OK, so he's just so with a T-H-E at the beginning. Well, the and Cyborg. I, I think I'd have to go down to the basement and dig it out, but I think his overpower card uh, said Cyborg Superman. Okay. So uh, even after he, he was no longer masquerading as Superman? I think so. Okay. Evan's coming through with the answer here. What's he got? Just oh, Cy- wait, it's just Cyborg. Well, that that was in, in overpower, so. Gotcha. Yeah, but I wasn't reading a lot of DC then, but I don't know that, that Victor Stone was front and center at that point, so they may have just been like, yeah, we'll just use this name. Okay. Good enough for me. <laughs> All right, next note. This book is brutal. <laughs> this book yeah, is this, brutal. Th- these three issues have to be, especially the first one, have to be the most violent Superman comics that the, have probably ever been produced. Oh, Doomsday's rampage through Apocalypse, where mm-hmm. there's one point where he punches a guy and 
his knuckle claws are like <laughs> through the back of the guy's head and he's just holding them there. And I was like, this is what I like. This is what I came to the party for right here. This is beautiful. He, yeah, Lionel would probably take credit for this as well. <laughs> right. DC had to get super serious with their action. Oh man, did they ever. Chris, I think you were like, this is kind of, it's it's definitely, uh, it's pretty violent. And I was like, oh really? I didn't realize how violent it would be. Was there any kind of like parental advisory on that or? Not that I saw on the front here. Because it seems a bit much, I mean, like I said, for for a Superman comic, when Doomsday is coming back on that cargo ship, I mean, it's almost like a horror movie. Yeah. Um, And, you know, the one dude gets like cut in half. And I mean, it fits with the story, but I'm, and I know, you know, comics haven't been for kids for a while, but at that point, I can imagine somebody going like, oh, here's this nice looking Superman book, Junior. And then, oh, my guy got ripped in half. I I was going to say, I'm assuming that because of the prestige format, they may have only been available in comic shops and not like on newsstands. I don't know that for sure, because I know some I know some prestige format stuff did make it to newsstands. I'm not sure if these did. So maybe they were counting on comic shop owners to kind of warn people away for like from younger kids reading. I don't who knows. But yeah, there's they didn't they didn't have any advisory type labels at that time. Not nothing on the front of this thing at all. This is what this monster was supposed to have been doing. You know, this is the, what I've wanted to see from this monster uh, that is just going about killing anything that's in its path. I still question the physics of that one shoulder spike stabbing at the apocalypse. Airport. <laughs> I don't blame you, sir. <laughs> there are, you know, I mean, it could be that 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 had happened earlier. And he's just been stuck there. That could oh. be. As, okay. as Doomsday continues to rampage. <laughs> just uh, kick. That, that, <laughs> that makes more sense than, uh, no, <laughs> Phil, don't back up. <laughs> that's, that's right. The underlings on the Apocalypse are named Phil. The splash pages in this thing are just off the chain. I, I think that definitely is one of the reasons why they made this a, a prestige book, because they were going mm-hmm. to, the art's not, the art is not lacking here. Yeah. It, and when they do a splash page, it's, it's beautiful. I mean, one of these pages I think I used for the uh, I just posted on the site is just straight up like Doomsday's face. That's just one page, but it looks beautiful. I definitely think that that's one of the defining factors of this story. Is yeah, using the splash page. Go ahead, man. Yeah, I was gonna say. I mean, each issue is I think forty eight pages, and it's still a pretty quick read because for one, there's a lot of action, but also like there's big splash pages, like you said, and even the pages that aren't splash pages there's a lot of like just huge panels like it's almost like uh jurgens was going for like a a big summer blockbuster movie feel for, yeah. for this book like a lot of big panels a lot of big images a lot of uh, widescreen stuff definite blockbuster movie feel i agree 100 percent. all right my last note here and i'll turn it over to you there chris uh because this will just all i have to do is say three words and that's doomsday versus dark side give us your thoughts <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that was pretty epic. When I had read this, I knew who Darkseid was, but I probably had never read a, a comic with him even in it at that point because I didn't read a whole lot of DC when I was younger. But I knew he was like one of the big the big bads in you know the DC Comics universe, and Doomsday handled him pretty efficiently. <laughs> yeah, if you didn't know who Darkseid was, they get it across that he feels like he could go out and handle this threat pretty easily. He's like, all right, that's it. I, you know, I'll go handle it myself. (laughs) Yeah. Eventually he's like, well, my, my army is getting obliterated. I'll deal with it. (laughs) (laughs) Doomsday gets hit with the Omega beans from his eyes. I know at this point in my life, when I'm reading this, I'm like, somebody is getting messed up. What is Doomsday going to look like (laughs) when he comes out of this? Because if he survives that hit and he gets up out of there and you're like, okay, Oh my gosh. And yeah, I mean, dark side gets leveled and is knocked out and he is not the winner of this fight. Mm. Not the winner at all. Well, I, yeah, I'm, I'm with you. That's the, the quickest I've seen dark side dealt with. Maybe not, not quite as uh, embarrassing for dark side as that, uh, issue of JLA where the atom takes him out, the atom and oh. green arrow, but, uh, this <laughs> It's, it's, it's pretty rough. And uh, yeah, that, that definitely drives home. I mean, maybe even more than the original Doomsday Superman fight, how how powerful he is. True. I mean, you know, Superman, he, he they fought, you know, for hours and hours and across several issues. And this is just like, hey, dark side. Boom. Yeah. 
I, I do have between this and the second issue a few questions about Omega Beam's physics. I think it works like most comic book powers, which is eh, it does whatever the writer needs it to. Yeah. Every time I see an Omega uh, Omega Beam, you know, it's not like it's a it's a straight shot. He's like curving yeah. it around something or going up and down and around. I'm like, how is he? Okay, maybe his maybe his. You watched sight... Wanted a bunch of times. What? <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> Oh man! But yeah, it seems right. like a lot of times when I see the Omega beams, like they don't act like it's supposed to be like the Omega beams will destroy anything, and and it never does. Yeah, didn't the Omega beams transport Bruce Wayne through time in that <laughs> when they thought he died? Yeah, at the end of Grant Morrison's run or something. Yeah, but I I actually think that was I want to say there was it was something else. It was uh-huh. it wasn't like the Omega beam. It was the Omega effect or the omega technicality or something i don't know <laughs> the omega technicality the omega mcguffin yeah there you go yeah. the omega plot device uh one thing that i thought was kind of interesting was the way like it opens with clark thinking back to his childhood when he was scared to go in the basement and they kind of use that throughout the three issues as like superman kind of dealing with like his fear because he's now he knows he can be killed, even though I guess technically he wasn't dead <laughs> after Doomsday yeah. killed him the first time. But he has that fear now. There's like this psychological thing going on with him feeling like a defenseless child. These images of the Jurgens does of young Clark. Most of them look pretty good. They look like a little kid. <laughs> but a couple of them remind me. Have you seen that meme of the John Burns? Uh, and, and I think it was in his X Men run where he draws two kids uh, like playing in the bathtub. I and, can't say I have. I'm going to have to look this up. And like, be very careful top, what search terms you enter, Jesse. That's true, yeah. <laughs> uh, at, the, at the top, the text is like, just draw two kids. It's easy. You can do this. Just draw two kids. It's like, it's supposed to be Burns' inner monologue. And then it's like, the result is like, basically two toddler bodies with like grown men's faces <laughs> are oh. in the bathtub. Oh. Um, that's how I, especially the issue or the panel where Clark is like running away from the basement door. Uh, it just is kind of goofy looking. <laughs> uh, right. Maxima shows up uh, right. when he's trying to find uh, maybe where he's trying to find out where Doomsday is or whatever. Maxima was part of the Death of Superman story uh, where she was part of that Justice League team that Doomsday ran through easily. And then she helped Superman you know, continued the fight for a little while before eventually she had to I think she had to like take some people to the hospital or something. And she offers to like go with Superman. And he's like, no, I've got to deal with this myself. I mean, I guess thematically that makes sense from a writer standpoint, but like why in the world would Superman refuse to basically take Wonder Woman with him to deal, right. to deal with I, it? Which I guess he doesn't know that Doomsday is alive yet, but still two reasons. <laughs> you know, I, I, I thought the same thing, but so two reasons. One, maybe he he doesn't want to put anybody else in danger because that's a Superman thing to do. Sure. And two, he probably figures Maxima's going to get handsy out in space. Oh, <laughs> yeah. But still, he's like, yeah, I, ju- I just got back with Lois. I'm not going to take uh, my would-be ex out into space. <laughs> Good point. Good. That, 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 that might even be the, the bigger concern. He's like, well, Maxima, you, you could... <laughs> You could get hurt, or so, uh, things could get awkward. We we covered a story. It was it was one of the big stories that happened right before the death of Superman. And Maxima was a villain in that story. Oh, really? he did. Yeah, he did not trust her at all. If you were just picking this up, yeah, I'd be on the same side you were. Like, oh my gosh, you know, bring her along, do something, you know, to where she can, because she is as I think she's very very powerful. Uh, she yeah, she, she seems is, like a a B level Wonder Woman sort of right. Me. Power yeah. levels, anyway. She has all She's... the powers of a Nissan Maxima. <laughs> <laughs> you, you you can cut that one out. Uh, you know, sure? Do not cut that out. <laughs> she, I think, was d- pretty duplicitous in that story. And then Superman's, I don't trust you as far as I can throw you. And I think that that's what's going on here. She offers, and he's like, I don't, you know. And yeah. Jurgens, I think, was uh, on this, the creative team still at that point. So he, he knows he might've even created maximum. I'm not sure. It's going to bug me. I need to figure out what the name of the story is real quick. Panic I'm, in I'm the ahead. sky. Is that what it is? Yes. That's what it is. Panic in the sky. Brainiac going, Oh, bring in war world. And we're coming to kick your butt, Superman. <laughs> and, uh, he, he takes up a whole team. Like to go up there and, yeah. <laughs> you kind of already mentioned the, the gory stuff. Like I love, uh, the way Jurgens does. It's always stuck with me. The, the, he punches that, 
one uh, soldier and his fist is just stuck inside of his skull. Yeah, yeah. it's just stuck <laughs> it's, it's, there. It looks so cool. <laughs> it does, man. It's so good. I did want to kind of jump off of your whole, uh, you know, your your mention about Superman worried about what's down in the basement, you know, as a kid. Yeah. You know, Doomsday is a monster, and that's repeated quite a few times throughout this whole thing. Like, Doomsday is just a thoughtless, mindless monster, it seems like, that anybody would be afraid of. You look at him, he's scary. Superman went toe-to-toe with this guy. Just like you said, he died. I mean, most people have a fear of death. And this guy, you know, this thing took it to Superman and killed him. So, yeah, he's trying to face his fears in some way in order to get past it. So the only way that he knows to do that, it seems like is to learn about the, uh, learn about his fears. Hence why I think a lot of what he's doing here, trying to learn about doomsday so he can kind of work through that. At first I was like, eh, that's kind of obvious. Thinking back to when he was a kid, but uh, being scared as a kid, but you got to figure that's probably the last time Superman was afraid of anything. True. I mean, you know, once his powers kicked in, what, what did he have to be afraid of? So it's, you know, at first I thought, eh, that's a little obvious, but uh, I mean, it, it, it's really effective and it makes a lot of sense to do it that way. You guys were getting into some of the big thematic stuff. My notes uh, my notes tended to be uh, focused a little more on the minutia. I, I don't know why the airport scene, at least until everybody started dying horribly, amused me so much. But, like, I never thought about the infrastructure and, like, day-to-day workers on Apocalypse. You know, usually it's just slave pits and chaos and everything. And <laughs> I'm like, I didn't know they had, like, minimum wage dudes. You know, the, the middle class on Apocalypse. And then the uh, the stuff where Superman goes looking for the linear men. I don't like I, I started to put, you know, where they say, yeah, we can't help you. We can't interfere with the timeline. And he goes, you guys are a real pain. Do me a favor and stay out of my way from now on. And I'm like, <laughs> that doesn't sound like Superman. Then I realized Dan Jurgens is writing this and he knows more about Superman than I ever will. So <laughs> if Dan Jurgens said Superman said that, I guess Superman probably would have said that. But it just I mean, it, I get that he's dealing, you know, with stuff he's never dealt with before, something that he's actually afraid of. But I don't know. It was just weird to hear uh, Superman going like. Heck with you. And, and he even smarts off to the kid's dad, you know, the, uh, the <laughs> one linear man's dad. He's like, yeah, maybe you should uh, teach your kid right from wrong while you still have a chance. I'm like, come right. on, Superman. It's, <laughs> it's a bit harsh. So Wave Rider and what's the other guy's name? Oh, Matt Ryder. That's Those Matt are the same Matt guy, Ryder. right? Yeah, I think so. Okay. That Matt Ryder. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. Also, well, I like that panel where Wave Rider gives Superman a hint about Apocalypse. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Matt Ryder has like this expression on his face that's like a telling look. Like, oh, I, I see what you did there. <laughs> what are you <laughs> trying to sneak one by me? I don't think so. Uh, time travel was in this, and I didn't really mention it in the synopsis because the whole linear men thing. I mean, Wave Rider gets Wave Rider gets involved, but why was he going back to talk to this the kid just because he was trying to get the w- Wave Rider's attention? Yeah, he didn't know how else was... to find them. Okay. Well. Okay, and obviously he knows that Wave Rider is would be able to help him figure out something uh, about the Doomsday's past because Wave Rider's, you know, he's he knows he's like the Watcher. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm thinking. He's like the Watcher. Uh, let's talk panels here. So mine is going to be the dude getting ripped in half as Doomsday is floating away on that asteroid, like where he uses the his uh, yeah. chain or whatever to whip, and he whips the guy right in the gut and just straight in half. This guy's dead. Um, that's mine. So I also like how they put the sound effect like through where he's getting ripped in half. Oh, no. Kidding, it's a really dude. Uh, good use of the lettering. Oh, so bloody. So bloody. <laughs> uh, all right, Evan, what do you got there, man? I like the one where uh, where Doomsday is just kind of like dragging Darkseid along after wow. he's beaten him. Yeah. And like and like Cyborg Superman or Cyborg whatever he is is, is talking to him like, "Hey, we're gonna do this and this." And Doomsday is just like, "Yeah, I'm I'm gonna go break stuff." <laughs> but uh, just uh, just you know j- just to him like Darkseid totally defeated and Doomsday like, "Yeah, I'm just dragging this thing along for the heck of it." Uh, that that's that's not something you you see a lot. Of. I mean, you know, no, it's bad enough to see Darkseid. You know, get his clock cleaned like that, but then Dark Side just, you know, like an afterthought. <laughs> right, right. You, you, how many books have that happening right there, where Dark yeah. Side is just completely unconscious and so like left to whoever's got a hold of him? I mean, it's it's very very rare if if it's happened at all. Um, yeah, good pick, good pick. What do you think, Chris? What do you got? I'm gonna go more into Jesse's wheelhouse with mine. Yeah. 
I've always uh, cracked up every time I read this and I get to the um, the soldiers standing around waiting for the ship to be cleared on Apocalypse. You know, Jurgens give you know they're all in this like full body armor uh, except for their face, but Jurgens made sure to give like one guy like really striking white eyebrows and another guy has a mustache so <laughs> kind of gives them all a different look but yeah it, obviously i'm picking the guy <laughs> the panel with the guy's decapitated head flying over <laughs> poor apocalypse dum dum dugan <laughs> yeah that that's my uh because i mean it's uh definitely gory <laughs> but like just the expression on the other two guys faces like uh we're, we may be in trouble here folks let me tell you, you are not going to have a hard time finding a panel or page in this book to pick if you were doing it on your own end. Like I, anybody else, I'm sure would have picked like one of those big one pagers that like the doomsday just ripping into Dark Side's back. That's a great yeah. one. Oh but yeah, these are all personal picks of ours, and yeah, I'll I'll go with like I got no problem going with some dude getting dispatched. <laughs> yeah. All right. Let's go ahead. We'll get into issue two here. Cyborg Superman, now going just by Cyborg, begins to take measures in order to control Apocalypse and make it his war world. Meanwhile, a wounded dark side comes to finding the stranded Superman and then collapses at Superman's feet. Wave Rider appears and talks to Superman, giving him a glimpse into the past of Doomsday. Oh, boy, here we go. So we see these scientists 250 million years ago experimenting with evolution in order to try to create the ultimate specimen. Their method, continually throwing a baby into a hostile planet, letting it get killed, cloning it, modifying its DNA, and repeating the process until a perfect specimen was able to survive the harsh environment and all the predators of the planet. The result of the completion of this experiment is Doomsday. Doomsday finds his creators and actually kills them for what they have put him through, and at some point made his way off the planet by hitching a ride on a visiting starship to a place called Calaton. There, Doomsday begins destroying that planet until its leaders developed a living weapon of energy named Radiant to try and kill Doomsday. The massive battle finally ended, and Doomsday was dead. The Calatons chained Doomsday up and sent him to float in space. At some point, the asteroid fell to Earth millions of years ago, where Doomsday lies dormant underground. Going to the present here, Darkseid wakes up and tells Superman he needs to deal with the cyborg. Superman finds the cyborg, engaging in a fight. During the battle, Superman restrains the cyborg so that Darkseid's Omega Beams can hit him full on. Another shot with an even more deadly blast appears to vaporize the cyborg. We soon learn Doomsday is back on Calaton, but has evolved since they last defeated him and will be impervious to any of their attacks. Superman looks to find Doomsday, heads to Calaton, try to, tries to head to Calaton to take him down. There you go. That is issue two. Evan, we'll start with you, man. What, what are your notes there, buddy? The origin uh, is friggin' brutal. Almost too much so, again, for a Superman comic. But, I mean, it's got all the hallmarks of, like, classic horror and sci-fi. You know, the scientists getting punished for their hubris. And definitely a good explanation for how Doomsday got to be the the way he is. And, of course, there's there's one more little twist left that we won't find out until next issue. One of the things that, that jumped out at me, and maybe it's just me not understanding the Omega Beams, because, again, I, I, I thought the whole point of the Omega Beams was they killed everything, but you have Superman going back and forth like, maybe I should just let Darkseid die. No, of course I can't do that, you know, because that, that's Superman. That's one of the things right. we like about Superman. He he always does the right thing. But then he just totally holds Hank Henshaw up like, uh, yep, here, here, Darkseid, zap him. <laughs> and then a few minutes, and then when it doesn't work, a few minutes later, Darkseid blasts him to smithereens, and Superman's like, what? You just killed the guy? And I'm like, Did, didn't you hold him in place the, for the first <laughs> shot? I, I don't know, but, I mean, maybe that's just me not not fully understanding it, but it, I, that that just seemed a, a little weird to me. Like, Superman's like, I can't let Darkseid die. Wait, why did you kill this guy? And then in between, here, Darkseid, shoot him with your death beam. It felt a, a, a little strange to me. But, uh, you know, I mean, the, the, the action in there is is great. You know, the the art, again, that big cinematic scale, uh, like like you guys were, were talking about. Excellent story, but just a, a few of the details in there uh, have me confused. And maybe that's my uh, my DC ignorance showing. 
I'd always wondered what the origin of Doomsday was. You know, I'd read Death of Superman. I knew what happened in that, but I didn't read anything past that. And here we finally kind of get this story that's telling us how this thing came to be. And yeah, you're right, Evan. This is definitely brutal. I mean, my goodness, you're watching as these panels unfold and you're seeing this scientist, you know, they got this cute little baby and then you see it just boop. They send it right out there into the uh, on onto the land by itself to where these things just destroy it immediately and kill it. You're like, I was wondering why it couldn't have been an adult clone. <laughs> it had to be a baby. I, mean, I know it was. That was really rough. I mean, even now I'm reading this thing and I'm going, "Jeezy, criminy." We're okay. All right, that's the way you want to go. That's the way you want to go. I will give him credit. Sometimes when you reveal a mystery origin, it takes some of the fun out of it. I mean, not that this uh, was particularly fun, this origin, but I mean, it. The this origin worked. Exactly. It, it's, it's not one of these where, like, it takes all the mystery out of the character, and it's like, oh, no, actually, uh, this was uh, Pete Ross's action figure that he sent into space, or, you know. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so, I mean, it, 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 was, it was a really well-done origin for what it is. It just what it is is horrible. It, it is a perfect explanation as to how this thing could actually evolve into what it is. This yeah mindless hate filled killing machine that doomsday is well no wonder i mean you watch it's not like this experiment takes months there are years that pass you can see as the scientists continue to grow old 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 they get older some of them die and get replaced right finally you know that you get this thing that actually you know this this baby is able to survive a night and then it's able to survive another night. And of course it may die and then they clone it again and do the experiment all over again. And then yeah. shockingly it's mad. <laughs> shockingly it's upset. Who I don't could have seen that why. coming? Don't understand why. One of the more, you know, extreme origins I've seen of a, of a super, super villain. You know, you guys are right about the brutality uh, that led to, to doomsday. Um, I do like, as you mentioned, as they show, the progression, Bertrand, the lead scientist, all smooth and young looking at the beginning. He looks like a, kind of like a gray alien. Yeah. Um, and by the end, he's all wrinkled and old. Like you can tell it's been, you know, lifetimes for normal people. But for this alien, he's lived probably decades, if not centuries, <laughs> as this experiment goes forward. Um, one thing that kind of stands out about this middle issue is it's kind of a lull in the action. Like there is some action with Superman taking on Hank Henshaw you know, with, with dark side's help, but it's a lot of like expository type stuff, just kind of revealing the origin of doomsday after all this time, which is cool and interesting. Like it, it's just kind of reading it on multiple reads. The second issue is kind of like the lull before you get back to the big action in the, in the third issue. The, yeah, I agree with you. There is a bit of a lull in the action, but you finally get the reveal. I mean, this had to have been one of the big questions of the nineties. Like, where did this yeah, thing come like, from? Yeah, because in Death of Superman, he basically explodes out of the earth, out of the ground, right? Uh, goes on a rampage, kills Superman, and then his body is thrown into space. Nothing was ever revealed about like where he came from or anything until this. Well, let's pick a panel then. I'm going to go with the last one. Uh, maybe it's cheating because it's technically two panels, but where Darkseid and Wave Rider are like, yeah, uh, there's no way you can beat Doomsday. He, you beat him once, he evolves. And Superman says, I don't care, I'll hunt him down one way or another. This has to stop. And then that last panel is the flashback to Superman, uh, you know, scared about the, the basement. Yeah. Um, so uh, like the, the juxtaposition there, but also the fact that this is Superman and he's probably never been this scared or vulnerable. And he's like, but I'm going to do what I have to do. So yeah. that's a good, good summing up of Superman. For sure. I'm going to go with uh, the image uh the the full page splash page of dark side taking cyborg out <laughs> with, the, oh. with the omega beams which is basically just a big like explosion the the thing i really appreciate about appreciate it with some of these with with jurgens on some of these panels is like he's showing the scale of like apocalypse other care but like the characters are like drawn much smaller but there's still like a lot of detail oh yeah uh, and I really like the, that image of Dark Side. You know, the, the small image of Dark Side at the bottom. You know, unleashing that giant explosion. Nah. There's also we see a lot of computer coloring, which was kind of in its early days at this point uh, yeah. throughout these issues. And 
it looks kind of dated in some ways, but I still kind of appreciate it. It's kind of like uh, <laughs> early CGI. <laughs> Sometimes it looks cheesy now, but I still kind of appreciate it uh, in some in some movies and stuff. And that's kind of how I feel about like computer effects and computer coloring in like '90s comics. And when you look at that panel that you're talking, that page, you know, most of everything around that, you know, it looks like it's drawn, but mm. in the middle iris, or I don't know if that's iris or whatever that is, but the middle part of that explosion there's no way that that are all dots that somebody drew there's, <laughs> yeah, there's like that, a shading like a yeah. shading around that middle yeah that feels digital to me and it looks great i mean it really does look fantastic it adds to this explosion uh that's going on here that's that's a good pick that's a good pick okay so this time i went with an easy one too this was doomsday versus radiant where radiant is killing doomsday where he is just getting pierced with all these massive, like, radiant blasts. Look at that. Mm -hmm. One of Doomsday's first defeats, which was pretty cool. Yeah, um, we didn't really talk about Radiant. He's kind of interesting. I, I think he only appears in this miniseries. I, if he appears later, I'm not aware of it. But I yeah, know. like, basically, he's just pure energy that's like this inbred royal family of this planet <laughs> yeah. uh, has, like, sacrificed all of their life essence to, to create him, which is really weird <laughs> and uh kind of interesting but first appearance second issue of doomsday uh how superman doomsday i think he appears <laughs> in that annual maybe in like a flashback uh, the doomsday okay. annual but. it says he also appeared in countdown to final crisis number 15 probably <laughs> just in the background somewhere i'm guessing I'm all right good. here we go issue three after the battle Darkseid secretly collects the consciousness of the cyborg as he believes it may be useful in the future. Superman, with the aid of the Mother Box, gets a computer-originated suit and weaponry specifically designed to help fight Doomsday. Ready for battle, Superman lots and... Of pouches. Oh, yeah. Lots of pouches. Arm, we got arm pouches. We've got... I mean, it's just all over the place. Um, got a head sleeve. Yeah. This first time I've ever seen this costume, I cannot remember Superman looking like this in anything I've ever seen. Uh, so, yeah, this uh, Mother Box generated costume, which it's not just a costume. I mean, there's Mother Box generated weapons that are going to be happening here. Mother Box kicking in some uh, work here to help Superman defeat Doomsday. So, ready for battle, Superman and Wave Rider head through a boom tube to Kalaton. On Kalaton, Doomsday is already fighting the Radiant, and this time he's able to win. Superman finds the beaten Radiant, who tells him that Doomsday is headed to attack the planet's power core. Reaching the beast, Superman is planning to attack Doomsday, but does but knows this time he cannot go blow for blow with him and must use all his abilities and help from the Mother Box. Wave Rider gets involved and learns that wherever he looks, Doomsday continues to see his creator, keeping Doomsday enraged. Here, Superman learns from Wave Rider that Doomsday was actually created on Krypton, but soon after this revelation, the Superman Doomsday rematch begins. As the fight rages, Superman is struggling, suffering a broken arm and being thrown into the planet's power core, causing a massive explosion. Wave Rider is also caught in this blast and appears to have been dematerialized. Superman barely survives, but is able to get away, finding Wave Rider's time travel bracelet. Using the mother box to guide the time bracelet, Superman is able to take Doomsday to a place where Superman may be able to have an advantage. The end of time. Luckily, Wave Rider appears, pulling Superman out of there as time ends, swallowing Doomsday in waves of entropy. Wave Rider brings Superman back home, and Superman thanks him, returning to Lois, feeling good that he has made the universe safer for now. There we go. Issue three. We had the battle. We had the rematch of the century in this thing. Superman versus Doomsday. Wow. New look for Superman at this point. Uh, we got weapons being weapons are involved. Uh, Superman getting a broken arm. All sorts of stuff was happening in this issue. Yeah, this is kind of the action packed conclusion. <laughs> I love the 90s tastic Superman uh, costume that they give him with the straps and belts and pouches. <laughs> and oh, yeah, the, the gambit style uh, head sleeve. They give him a sword for some reason <laughs> and other weapons. Don't a forget battery, that battery pack. Battery pack. Yeah. <laughs> you can tell. Yeah, but, you can tell it's the early '90s because because there's no wireless technology here. Nope. <laughs> did he have a Did he have a gun at one point? Uh, uh, ultrasonic uh, gun. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. I like the rematch with the Radiant. Uh, we get 
a couple pages of Doomsday getting his his revenge on on the energy being. So there's a lot of different you know fighting going on. We also get a throwback to Superman's classic burn line, which I think it's probably been overused at this point. This may be this the only the second time he had done this where. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the Alan Moore story, The Man Who Has Everything. Uh, yeah, oh, I was just I, looking it up because I, I was flipping by that, and I'm like, wait a minute, that sounds familiar. Uh, yeah, he, he it's a story. I think they even adapted it for the Justice League animated series, but I think you're um, right. a, a Mongol has, like, tricked Superman into, like, a fantasy world. I think he's got one of those plants. Black uh, Mercy. The Black Mercy. Yeah, that puts Superman into like a state where he's like dreaming. And anyway, when he comes out and comes to, he's so angry, like he just screams burn and uses his, um, his heat vision to attack Mongol. This is like a reference to that. And I think he, they've probably done it like every two or three years. It probably happens now because <laughs> comics just want to constantly reference themselves. Um, oh yeah. But um, pickles on my burger burn. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we, it's, it's cool to see, doomsday evolving in real time oh, yeah. we see him do like a almost like a web shooter style <laughs> shooting his bone claws out to attack superman and then when superman uses these the uh, ultrasonics his bones kind of cover up his ears to keep him from uh, getting disoriented by those so a lot of cool stuff and a cool like ending with wave rider pretty much like giving the ultimate there's no way you can come back from this <laughs> uh death to a character but as Evan said earlier, this is comics, so we, we know we'll see Doomsday again. But yeah, real, I really like this finale. The bone claw thing, they must be flexible in some way. Because, I mean, he's fly- <laughs> and Superman is flying all around, and these things are bending this way and that, and, and while they're still stuck in his shoulder. Yeah, they, um, they seem to be malleable once, you know, he, he shoots them out and uses them as, like, fishing line or something. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. harpoon of some sort or something. Yeah, the ending of this book, I mean... You have to think to yourself as you are going, as you're reading through this. I mean, if you knew that Superman and Doomsday had fought before and both of them had apparently killed each other. Yeah. What is the rematch going to be like? Who's going to win and who is going to kill the other one? And then you so you start in issue one. You're like, OK, well, Doomsday's back. He's up to his, you know, he's up to his shenanigans again. He's killing people left and right. Superman's going to go try and stop him. But then you get to issue two and you start to realize, holy cow, this this thing is near unstoppable. He he was stopped one time and he that was before he got sent to Earth. And then he fought Superman. He, he's very much if I want to do a Star Trek reference, but he's very much a, a, a Borg like character where the Borg, you can attack them. There's a ton of them out there, but they adapt to whatever's attacking them. So the next time you attack them, and it, it, it's usually within seconds, if you hit them with something, they're going to adapt and be able to fend off that attack and therefore continue on with whatever they were trying to do. That's very much what Doomsday is. How in the world? He's already fought Superman. How is he going to actually adapt? You know he's going to. How does Superman have a chance here? Well, That's- Superman is also more powerful than he was. Like Once they had the return... They, I, I don't remember specifics, but I remember they kind of referenced like he's he's more powerful than ever now that he's come back. But right, obviously, even then, not necessarily up to the task. <laughs> right, and the assistant, the, the assistants with another box and everything like that. You know, that's great. You know that Superman is in for a, the fight of his life. He has to adapt to try and figure out how to beat this thing. He ends up defeating it, but he does not kill this thing because he can't. The only thing that can is time. And at the end of this, that is what happens. Like they they have to throw him to the end of time and just be consumed by the end of time. Again, as far as story goes, that feels like that's exactly what should have happened. Like you can't beat this thing. <laughs> the only thing that you can do is like throw it into the future and never deal with it again. <laughs> I, I, I'll nitpick one thing. They're talking about Doomsday is going to this power plant and if he destroys it, he could wipe out everybody on the planet. And then he kind of does. Yeah. <laughs> and then happens. it's okay. <laughs> right. Well, they said he might. So it's like, oh, but if he gets to the climate, to the uh, atmosphere control, then we're really in trouble. <laughs> that, that That's nitpicking over details. The action's great. And what, what I really, really like about this is so often when you get a character like Doomsday who comes in, I mean... They make a big deal, and you know they're going to bring him back eventually. And, and then you kind of get into the law of diminishing returns. Like, you know, 
I, I know, Jesse, you, you did something on like the first appearance of Carnage a while back. Right. And then next was Maximum Carnage, where it was like 14 parts and, you know, every B-level superhero that Spider-Man could find in New York. You know, Carnage had an army and all this stuff. And then I think the next thing I read with Carnage probably wasn't canon, but it was like one of those novels, and it was just Spider-Man taking out Carnage. And then a few years later, Carnage shows up in the background of the prison break in New Avengers, and Sentry <laughs> rips him in half in space. And he's like, mm. I mean, granted, Sentry's more powerful, but, you know, Carnage went from a huge event to this dude that shows up in the background when we need a villain. I remember reading Doomsday Wars, and I know he's he's popped up since then, but at least for this one, they did not diminish Doomsday. They ratcheted it up e even. I mean, they, Jurgens kept making references to Superman saying, well, I can't do this. This is what happened last time. I've, so they're explaining the fight isn't lasting longer because they need it to to sell a comic. They're, they're explaining in the story that Superman's trying things differently, but Doomsday is more powerful. So they, they really did a good job of stepping it up instead of just rehashing it, taking Doomsday down a, a few notches to you know, put out some more comics. So I, I, I thought they did that really well. If you were going to do a sequel, not explaining where Doomsday came from and having the death of Superman be the only Doomsday story would have been effective, but, but we know comics doesn't work that way. So if you're going to do a sequel, I, I don't think you could have done it much better than this. Yeah, it'd be kind of tough to top the fact that this guy killed Superman. <laughs> you know? And you got to try and write the sequel for that. Like, how do you take it up? How do you surpass what happened in that book? Really, you can't, but what you can do is provide a reason why. And I think that's yeah. definitely what this what this has going for it is the mysterious nature behind Doomsday's origin that gets revealed. And then we've got to take that, we've got to make it make sense, and then we've got to provide a fight that actually, you know, at least is somewhat worthy of what happened before and figure out a way for Superman to try and beat him. And still, it's not just Superman that beats this guy. It's Superman, yeah. Mother Box, and Wave Rider have to try and take him out. So I mean, really, like, the only other thing you could do would be, I don't know, have Doomsday attack Superman while he's flying Lana Lang's baby across the country. Oh, wait. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> what do you think of the reveal that Doomsday was from Krypton? I mean, in, in a way, it, it makes sense. I mean, we know that Krypton did a lot of genetic engineering and stuff, and it makes sense thematically. I remember thinking when I first read it, it reminded me a little bit of the Sam Raimi Spider-Man movies. You know, the only people who get powers are people with a deep personal connection to Peter Parker. <laughs> you know, it's like it's like there there couldn't have been just like one random dude. Yeah. Yeah. Who got, I mean, I I understand it thematically, but you know, it, it was never like Spider-Man was in conflict with these people because he's a hero and they're a villain. It was, well, you know, uh, Peter Parker's neighbor's cousin cut me off in traffic, and I have to avenge him now. <laughs> oh, he's Spider Man. Great. That that just that just you know lets me kill two birds with one stone. To to a certain extent, I was like, oh, of course they're tied together. But I mean, it it really does work thematically. So, what is the Doomsday Wars? That title is a little misleading. It's basically just uh, kind of the third part of the Superman Doomsday conflict i guess okay um, so doomsday comes back in that one and the reason i was excited about that is because you know when doomsday first showed up in dead of superman he fought the justice league but it was like the b level or maybe even c level justice league it was blue beetle and booster gold Bloodwind, who was i guess really martian manhunter but uh, it wasn't the heavy hitters in Doomsday Wars, he fights the Justice League. I was like, oh, finally. And it was like the Grant Morrison era of Justice League. So it was Wonder Woman, Green Lan Kyle Rayner, Green Lantern, The Flash, Batman, Orion was on. It was in that one. Mm. But when they actually had Doomsday fight them, you saw almost none of the fight. You kind of saw a little bit of Wonder Woman fighting them. And that was pretty much it. Uh. Uh, it, was mostly, it mostly took place like off panel. And uh, so I was like super disappointed in that. And then like Evan was referencing earlier, Superman for, for a lot of the story is trying to transport a, a baby, Lana Lang's baby, to a hospital. Is it like overseas or something? I can't remember. I'm trying to get him out out of Smallville it was the old the old hospital in, in Smallville. Yeah, and there's like I, a wind I'm storm, flipping through so. it now. I, I have not reread it after uh, that that first time. Yeah, and I mean, I'm probably being too hard on it, but I just remember being really disappointed by the Justice League stuff, being really just underwhelmed, like compared to like. Hunter Prey, which I think is really good. But yeah, there, there's uh, 
probably some interesting stuff in it. And Dan Jerkins also wrote and did the art on that one, but I didn't like it. <laughs> I, yeah, well, the ti- you said misleading title. I was like, oh man, there's going to be like 20 Doomsday is going to be showing up or something. <laughs> I, 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 and we just, well, that happens all them. but not in Doomsday Wars. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Eventually, it seemed like when it, when uh, other writers started u- using Doomsday and other stories, they never really knew what to do with him. He was never as effective after those first, like kind of like uh, Evan said, it was diminishing returns eventually with Doomsday as you, well. Yeah, you can't use him like a regular villain. There's no way. Like you put this guy away for like ten years. Uh, right? <laughs> you can't say that. You you put this guy away for like three years. And then maybe bring him back. And when you bring him back, it's got to be another event. I mean, it, it, that's yeah. the only way that you make him feel like he matters. Yeah, it should be something special. Right. It's got to be something that is as huge. Uh, you know, he's the big villain reveal. Somebody's brought Doomsday back. You know, we've been fighting so and so this whole time. And all oh, no, now we got to deal with Doomsday. Uh, we got a, a satisfying end to the arc of the of Superman conquering the fear of the imaginary monster. Uh, we did get that like towards the end of this book. I think not enough blood and guts there, though. Um, <laughs> <laughs> OK, all right. Well, who whose turn is it to go first here? Go ahead, Evan. OK, okay. Evan, you get to go first with with your uh, pa- pick your panel. I picked uh, Super Mega Extreme 90s Superman going through the boom tube with a uh, wave rider. It, it's the one it's on the page that has him flying over like the fire pits on Apocalypse. Yeah. Yeah, you're and uh, Wayward says, I'm coming along. And he says, well, as long as you're going to help, last thing I need is someone following just to watch me die again. <laughs> Good line, too. <laughs> I'll go ahead and pick mine. Go back to my notes. Mine was Doomsday holding Superman up like Bane did with Batman. I oh. thought there was going to be a back break going on here or something. <laughs> we already had an arm break. I thought he was going to, like, just bring him down across his knee or something crazy like that. Well, it would not be it would not be pleasant for Superman if he did that, though, because number one, Doomsday has these things. He's got spikes on every like joint bone yeah. spikes coming out and including the knees. It would have been bad news for Superman at that point. He would have been impaled. There's a part in this book, if I remember right, where S- Doomsday finally recognizes, I think, who superman is and he he says the word metropolis and superman's mm-hmm. like you can speak and you're like oh <laughs> oh man this is i thought he yeah. said metropolis back in the old uh yeah. the original did yeah, he? he does okay. he yeah he says it uh because he sees a, a wrestling ad on on a tv with like a hulk hogan looking character ca- talking about metropolis Oh, okay. But I mean, in, in fairness to Superman, he did get hit in the head a bunch of times and died and came back. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's cool if his memory's a little fuzzy. He gets hit with that sword, too, at one point. I'm looking at that panel. I just scrolled up a little bit where Superman hits him with that sword and Doomsday is like made of clay or something. And it's almost like right. he, he just he, like he has no internal organs to be wounded. He oh. you know, survives on solar energy. Crazy, crazy stuff. What do you got there, Chris? The panel I picked was uh, Doomsday delivering what would be the killing blow to R- the Radiant. Jumping through him, you see like the kind of like some Kirby crackle going all around Doomsday as he's able to like disrupt the Radiant's energy and, and kill him. And uh, yet another, that was one of my notes here, was like, we get some people getting torn in half. Yeah. In these three books. And I think that's what happens to him. Then. I mean, he like goes right through yeah. him. He becomes basically like a ghost, like apparition for a while before he dis- dissipates completely. And has a sick look in Doomsday, too. Like all you see are it's just completely like blacked out mm-hmm. except for his teeth and his eyes. And obviously the outline. That's a good one, man. Like it. I like it. All right. We did it. Superman Doomsday Hunter Prey. Right, let me ask you this. Who, who would you recommend this to? Probably people who uh, who heard about the death of Superman, but uh, I don't know that that are right in that right in that that sweet spot of maybe they didn't read it regularly, but they're interested enough in comics to to find out more. You know, like okay. hey, that wasn't that wasn't the end. Let's get into plugs. Thanks first off for joining me this evening. It's getting close to Christmas. I don't know when this. I think it's going to air in about a week or so. So these two guys join me tonight here, a couple days outside of Christmas, uh, to get this comic book in and discuss it. Can't tell them enough how much i appreciate that let's go ahead we'll get in the plugs here first chris armstrong i i'm rolling around marietta today it's you know i'm trying not to slide off the side of the road 
Meanwhile, I'm listening to Shane Black Christmas Time on the old uh, Because Movies. So why why don't you tell everybody where they could find that and what's been going on with you there, buddy? I appreciate you listening. (laughs) uh, (laughs) I've got a uh, movie podcast I do with my buddy AJ. It's called Small Screeners, where we usually talk about direct-to-video and made-for-TV movies. Uh, we've also started kind of a sister podcast to that called Because Movies, where we, for Halloween, we did a series on the original slashers from the 70s and 80s and their modern day remakes. Uh, and then for, for uh, December here, we've been doing a, a Shane Black uh, Christmas uh, series. So that's what's been going on over there. Uh, that's all in the small screeners feed. Uh, also on Twitter and Instagram at BrodyMan34. So you can check me out there. And uh, small screeners also has Instagram in. Twitter feeds at small screeners. Very good. Very good. Yeah, I think you guys was talking kiss, kiss, bang, bang on this latest episode, right? We did uh, Lethal Weapon, uh, The Long Kiss Goodnight, Kiss, Kiss, Bang, Bang, and we've got Iron Man 3. I think that's going to drop tomorrow, if I can get Ooh, it okay. in time. Yeah. Oh, man, was, was The Long Kiss Goodnight, was that Shane Black? Uh, he was the screenwriter, yeah. He, he okay. wrote... Yeah, he wrote Lethal Weapon, and he wrote Long Kiss Goodnight, and then he directed uh, Kiss, Kiss, wrote and directed Kiss Kiss Bang Bang and Iron Man Three. Yeah, I remember that. I, I didn't I didn't connect with that. I think I think the Long Kiss Goodnight was my first published movie review. Oh, oh really? really? That's cool. Yeah, That's cool. well, in the uh, in the Beaver Voice, the high school newspaper. <laughs> nice. Did it get a did it get a good rating? Uh, yeah, I, I, I think so. I, I enjoyed it. I mean, anytime you got Samuel L. Jackson uh, spitting out lines like that, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's a good time. Uh, all right, Evan Bevins, asterisk 51, Defenders all the time, all day long over there. Uh, Secret Shh. Defenders, by the way. <laughs> Secret Defenders. <laughs> Don't tell anybody. <laughs> <laughs> tell them all about it, Evan. Where can they find you, buddy? Asterisk 51.blogspot.com. Kind of fell off on the, uh, the Christmas content this year, although you can still go back and uh, read my ode to Marvel 2-in-1 number 8, where the thing and Ghost Rider save Christmas. It's a, it's a beautiful Beautiful story by, by our buddy Steve Gerber. I'm uh, rapidly coming to the end of my read through of Secret Defenders. And so probably going to be starting up soon. Uh, a look back at uh, Just Imagine Stan Lee creating the DC Universe. I give Ravage 2099 the respect you guys won't. <laughs> and uh, you may uh, find a, a review of whatever I dug out of the uh, movie bin at Dollar Tree occasionally. And, uh, you know, let's see, we're, we're getting back to the Super Bowl, so I'm going to have to soon. So I'll have to throw in some more uh, football content on there. Maybe uh, go back to the NFL Super Pro or Kickers Inc. Well, Kickers Inc. <laughs> so yeah, you, you never know. But yeah, we're working, uh, working my way through uh, through Secret Defenders and then uh, going to gonna find some new uh, obscure series to uh, to explore. All right, I like it. I can tell you that Evan and I, by the time this airs, I think Evan and I will have a couple episodes, actually. I've split it up into two. I didn't tell you this, Evan, but I've split it up into two. We did a discussion for the Source Material Comics podcast on what I titled A Trilogy of Tumultuous Stanley Tells, I think is what I decided to call it. There you anyway. go. There we go. So Stan, Stan Lee uh, wrote three tales that Evan and I are discussing in order to celebrate the 100th birthday of Stan Lee. Uh, and also the Superblog team up provided anybody else is going to pro- provide any content for yeah, that. I, well, I, I think the I think the the Superblog team up event got pushed back a little but Some some people are still going to put stuff out for his uh, his 100th birthday. I mean, okay. it's, it's, it's not like there's a shortage of Stan Lee content and it's not like there's a bad time to appreciate Stan Lee. So. Right, right, right. So I, I will probably uh, at the very least uh, repost uh, the issue of my uh, post on the issue of Ravage that was written by Stan Lee and featured a cameo by Stan Lee. We talked Fantastic Four number 12, X-Men number nine. And Spider-Man, one story out of Spider, the Amazing Spider-Man Annual Number Two, where Spider-Man meets Doctor Str- Doctor Strange. Uh, so you can check that out. That should be airing, I think, prior the week prior to when this is planning to air that the 28th, and then on the 29th, Evan and I continue our Stanley discussion where we talk about our top five Stanley cameos, and they aren't all movies, folks. So tune in to check that and out. They're all in the MCU. No, <laughs> they are not. They are not. Uh, and uh, also. We get into a little bit of a Marvel Snap discussion at the end of that episode. So if you play the Marvel Snap mobile game, you can hear Evan and I's thoughts on it, even though it's probably pretty dated now. Like, I think we were, 
you know, that was before what's been happening in Marvel Snap. Even uh, new seasons, I think, hit. We probably aren't griping about the leader as much in there. At least I'm not anyway. I don't gripe about the leader. I love the leader. I hate the leader. Not a, not, a, not a leader. I love the leader. The leader is perfect. Not a, not a, not a, not a leader. Not a, not a, not a, not a leader. Not a, not a, not a, not a leader. Not a, not a, not a, not a leader. I, I, I am so woefully inept when it comes to Simpsons references. Like, Aww. I suck at them. Like, I can maybe get one or two. I didn't get that one. <laughs> That's for sure. I All didn't right. either. Don't feel bad. I, but, hey, he he gave me the link, so guess what? It's going it's, into the podcast. <laughs> it's, a perfect, it's a perfectly cromulent mistake to make. Oh, oh. Now, see, that was a Simpsons reference, wasn't it? Yes. <laughs> I'm getting out of here. Yeah, for myself. Hey, listen, you're you're listed to this episode on the source material comics feed, most likely. So you can go out there. You can check out other issues, not other issues, but other unspoken issues uh, episodes. Uh, me and Chris got together a long time ago, started this podcast. We've had a ton of episodes in the can, uh, excuse me, on the feed. You know, we're we're reaching over seventy we don't episodes. Even know where you time. record. <laughs> I am in <laughs> currently on the toilet. Then we also have the source material comics podcast which i just plugged one for that so y'all can check that out all sorts of comics content being discussed right here on this feed so with that being said that is evan bevins over there is chris armstrong i'm jesse starcher getting out of here have a good one bye-bye thanks for joining us unspoken issues is part of the unspoken decade.com the home for 90s comics blogs and podcasts unspoken issues also has a facebook group you can join if you are interested just search the unspoken issues podcast and request to join all of this would not be possible without w2mnet.com and the rattlich and broadcasting network so make sure to seek them out for more podcasts if you enjoyed what you heard today please feel free to share and we look forward to entertaining you again soon 